I wasn't anticipating filming this today, <laughs> but I went to see a friend and I wore makeup and I figured don't let it go to waste. So hey world, it's Paige and I am here to talk about Kevin Kwan's most recent release, Sex and Vanity. I think Paige is popping in to say that I work at Penguin Random House Canada. It's something I had to disclose when I'm talking about one of our books, which Sex and Vanity is. So I'm biased toward this book because I work for the company that publishes it. This was going to be part of a bigger video. I'm still doing another video about like romance reading in 2020 for me because I was never much of a romance reader. I used to be in like when I was a teenager, but like since I moved to Canada, I'd never really read romance books and now I'm trying to get back into them and this was going to be one of the books in that wrap up that I'm still filming. But I don't think I would call this a romance because obviously he wrote the Crazy Rich Asian series, which I also read last year. I finished it last year. And and I really enjoyed that series for what it was and I really enjoyed the movie <laughs> like I think I liked the movie almost more than I liked the series I was talking to a friend about it today which is another reason I decided to film I felt like after I finished this book and I started reading another book immediately afterward for the wrap-up video and I just felt like this wasn't a rom-com and therefore it couldn't really go in that wrap up. This book definitely does have a romantic plot line in it <laughs> that is like the center point of this story is this woman trying to decide between these two men. It wasn't literary but it's sort of like a commercial literary fiction. My friend described it sort of like as such a fun age which it is sort of exploring more complex societal issues with the added element of all like the fun dramatic things you would expect from a more commercial piece of fiction. So <laughs> before I get into it I should explain what Sex and Vanity is. It is a retelling of of A Room with a View, but I have not read that book, so I cannot speak to its accuracy as a adaptation. I've read a couple of reviews on Goodreads and people said that the part where they're in Capri for this novel is pretty much a scene by scene retelling, so maybe I would not have enjoyed this book as much as I ended up enjoying it if I had also read that book because of the faithfulness to it. So this book follows Lucy Churchill. She is a biracial, half Chinese, half white girl. Her white side of the family is extremely old money rich, and her mother is I some kind of scientist. She is famous in her own right and her father died when she was very young but she has always grown up around her father's side of the family because her mother felt like because her father died she needed to raise them with his family so they had a part of him but her family is very problematic and very racist and just not the best people. So she goes to Capri at the beginning of this novel to celebrate her friend Isabel's wedding. This book just like Crazy Rich Asians is all about extravagance and wealth so it's a very luxurious affair. There she meets George. They have a little summer romance fling during this week of the wedding and then they never see each other again after they separate. And then we join them four years later. We see that Lucy is engaged to somebody else. She's engaged to this man named Cecile who fits very well in with her family. He's new money instead of old money so he has his own problems with her family but he is also the worst. <laughs> and she runs into George again because his mother ends up through extenuating circumstances involving her fiance renting a house in East Hampton where they also own a home. So they fall back into each other and the plot travels from there is, is you, it's what you anticipate will happen in this happens in this. I feel primarily this book was about Lucy grappling with her own identity. There's a quote toward the end of the book where George tells Lucy that it's only when you're, you know your truest self that everything can happen, like good things can happen basically. And I feel like this book from the beginning, like yes, it's all about the extravagance and it's all about old money versus new money debate that we saw in Crazy Rich Asians. Like a lot of the themes from Crazy Rich Asians are also in this book, but it focuses on identity in a different way. In Crazy Rich Asians, with Rachel specifically in the first book, we focus on the identity and diaspora and what it means to be Chinese American versus Chinese. <laughs> but in this book, we focus on what it means to be biracial and sort of that navigation of identity, which obviously I was very interested in when I heard that she was biracial and that would play an element in the book. And what was interesting to me about the way he decided to portray this is you could use the relationship she's torn between George, who is Chinese, and Cecile, who's white. He is a quarter Latinx, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure his mother was, but she was white passing because she got surgery so that she could fit in with the WASP society, which is a whole other thing we could get into. I completely just did not finish my thought in this part of the video, but what I was trying to say is her choosing between George and Cecile is basically her trying to 
come to terms with her identity because Cecile is the part of like white part of her identity that she feels is accepted and George is the Chinese part of her identity that she feels like she has to hide or that she should be ashamed of. But it was a lot of Lucy struggling with her own internalized racism toward herself because she grew up with such a Wasi family and she felt like she was the odd one out because her family were very, they were very microaggression and racist. Um, her grandmother called her her little China doll, which was, <laughs> and these things are never called out on the page, but as a reader, if you are paying attention, you know everything they're doing is horrible and it's sort of like with such a fun age where the people who are performing these microaggressions do so with the best sort of intentions. They're not doing it to be malicious, but it's still harmful and it's still wrong. And when I was talking to my friend about it today, we were discussing how Kevin Kwan with this book and Kylie Reed with Such a Fun Age, it's a dual story. If you are looking to find the more complex social issues that the authors are discussing that they've weaved into the story, namely for this book, the identity and the whole idea of erasure of her Chinese heritage because of her white side of the family and because she grew up with them and what was culture accepts versus what they don't and the exotification of <laughs> mixed race people because they have both Eurocentric and non-Eurocentric features that make them look exotic and the idea that Lucy felt like she was running away from her heritage because she felt like she wouldn't be able to fit in with the society she'd grown up in if she fully embraced it and she's always jealous of her brother who has more Eurocentric features than she does and takes more after their dad but those are like weaved into the backdrop of very dramatic very interesting and juicy stories that if you're not looking for the smaller details and you're not reading between the lines of all the exchanges that are happening, you get a good story regardless. You get, uh, for Kevin Kwan, you get like a fun summer adventure where you're in Capri and you're in East Hampton and you're in the wealthy side of New York. Like, it's still as extravagant as Crazy Rich Asians and it's still with wildest characters. Kitty makes an appearance. I'm not gonna say where, but I actually almost teared up because I was like, oh my god, I love that series so much. If you're not looking for it, you still get a great story out of it, in my opinion. Kevin Kwan is a kind of writer where it's either hit or miss for you. You'll either really like like his style of writing so if you've read the crazy asian series and you liked his style of writing that with like the annotations and everything you will still fall into this one it will still be a very entertaining read for you i think i still like the crazy Rich asian series more but i did enjoy this for like a fun summer read and i was surprised by <laughs> the additional exploration of identity that was in the novel i will say that i probably enjoyed it because i was inferring all of this stuff about identity because if you're just reading it for the strict like the romance element of it it's very kind of rushed in a way because you don't really spend a lot of time with George and Lucy. I found it hard to believe toward the end that they loved each other as much as much as they thought they did. I was taking it more allegorically like she was returning to her culture and really like understanding herself fully like accepting that side of herself that's what I took from it and her accepting George was her accepting that side of her identity. If you're reading it like for the literal romance <laughs> you might find it hard to believe especially because you don't get a lot of time with them being together. You get the whole bit of Capri which I really the Capri portion of this book was the best part of this book to me and probably because I haven't read A Room with a View, so I wouldn't be able to compare it, and I just thought it was all great and fun. But I also really enjoyed her relationship with Cecile, because even though they weren't meant to be together, they still had this camaraderie. I was expecting him to react badly to something that happens in this book a lot more than he does end up doing, and he's just, he's not a likable character, but he's not somebody that I vehemently hated in the same way that I hated a lot of the family members of Lucy, like the Churchills, I just did not like any of them. Charlotte, which is her cousin, who's a lot older than her, who takes her to Capri, who is her guardian. He tries to make a redemption plot for her toward the end, but I just, I never liked Lucy's family. And she doesn't like her own family. But yeah, if you are reading this for the romance element, it's not the point of the book to me in the way that Rachel and Nick were so centered in the book. I feel like Lucy was so chaotic and she just does not know what she wants in herself. She's not so self-assured in the way that Rachel was that the story was more about her coming, like her discovering herself. That's what this was for me. And so you might not be satisfied with the ending if you're there for the romance. I will say that even though I really love the concept of everything and I really liked all the themes that were displayed, it wasn't the most in-depth look into these things and arguably that's not what I needed from this book. I did not need this to be an in-depth exploration into biracial identity. It just touched on the topics and I feel like because he's straddling the line between t discussing these issues and also giving a very compelling story, he 
didn't give himself the full permission to like fully lean in. I feel like it would have been more literary if he'd ended up leaning in further into that side of things. But I do think I still would recommend reading it. I want other people to read it just so I could discuss it with them, to be honest. I haven't seen a lot of reviews of this book online. But it just came out like a month ago, I think now. But I did. It's it's a, it's a Kevin Kwan novel. If you've read Crazy Rich Asians, you know what you're gonna get into. It's basically that. It's not as good, but it's still decent. I didn't hate it at all. Like, it was very compelling. I could not put it down. His writing style, I've learned to read it in a way that I enjoy it. He does a lot of descriptive elements of like places that they're at or clothes that they're wearing. So I would skim that kind of stuff because I'm not interested in those like extraneous details. I really want to get into the character dynamics. So I was focused more on that and that's how I've learned to read these books and really appreciate them. So that might be something to consider. I will say I didn't like Lucy. She's a protagonist and she was interesting to read about but I don't think that she fully came to terms with herself like her own internal struggles weren't resolved by the end of the novel for me which is kind of unsatisfying but I'm fine with being unsatisfied at the end of the novel because it's like real life like we tend to not fully come to self-actualization uh so quickly so I was not bothered by that and I know that some people might be. If I had to sum up this whole rambly video <laughs> I would say that I was pleasantly surprised by the depth that I found in the story because I was just expecting like a fun summary. There were some fat phobic elements in this book, some characters said some really fucking weird shit and I was not surprised because it came from her white side of the family, the waspy rich people, and I was like, this just goes to show how fucking shitty they are. <laughs> like, they were the worst people. But also, it wasn't necessary at all to the book, so that's just something I wanted to fly. I can't speak to a lot of the other rap in this book, but I would encourage you to seek out own voice reviewers on Goodreads and elsewhere to figure out if this is a book you want to read. Those are all my thoughts on Sex and Vanity. I'm going to be posting this on the day that I post my romance video as well so I will leave um, a card to that so you can go watch that if you want to and see what else I got up to what else I read and I will see you guys in my next video.